We hope you enjoy listening to this weekly podcast from Lifeline Church. Find out more by visiting lifelinechurch.co.uk. Nature of the British, you know, uh, up to our neck in muck and bullets, we press on, Sergeant, to win through and all those sorts of weird and wonderful statements. I want to take it beyond that because we're the people of the living God. But let me just read something I felt God quickened to me as I was considering this, this situation. Of course, it's a difficult time. Of course, it's interrupted plans. It's, there's concern about the health of the nation, of the people and of the economy and of education and yet God still calls us to be shining stars in the darkness. Let me just remind you of how that's to be because it's not about strength of character, it's about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Let me read from Psalm 18 verse 28. Lord, you O Lord Keep my lamp burning. That's about shining lights. My God turns my darkness into light. I love this bit. With your help, Lord, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. And actually, I can kick the trend by the power of the Holy Spirit. See, when God calls us to be shining lights, he empowers us to do that, to show what he's like. Let me just read on a little bit. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is flawless. He is a shield for all who take refuge in him. Let's be sure that we do that so that we can fulfill what he really wants. For who is God beside the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and makes my way perfect. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a a bow of bronze. You give me your shield of victory and your right hand sustains me. You stoop down to make me great. You broaden the path beneath me so that my ankles do not turn. That is what God does. This is what he will do for us at this time, so that we can actually be what he calls us to be. This is not about the stiff upper lip. This is about what God can do in us. Let's believe him. Let's look to him. Let's find our place in him so that we can do that. So we want to continue... Uh, with our theme, the thing that God's been saying to us, the supernatural element with friends like these, (laughs) but with biblical friendship, we can actually show what God is like. Now, we're going to have to adapt. We're going to have to look to God for creativity as we go into this next lockdown. It seems to get in the way of what we're, we're planning, but God knows. I mean, he knew all of this before he ever set up upon this course. And I believe as we look to him from that place of his strengthening, that he will give us creative ways, understanding, ability to actually do the very thing he's talking to us about, to be friends in a biblical way. We've been looking at the spirit in us that enables us to be more than we can ever be ourselves. And we have looked at being supernatural friends, friends that have the ability to go way beyond the natural. Now I really want to take a moment to thank those of you that responded to my request last week to answer those questions and and give me the benefit of your answers and I trust that I've incorporated that uh, in what we're doing uh, this week and uh, if I have missed anything out then please uh, feel free to come back to me. You see God has called us 
Last week we talked about the social uh, and functional friendships in more detail. But God has called us to something far more than either of those. And he's actually stirring a desire uh, in many now for this biblical friendship. That's what God does. He causes a, de a desire to be formed within us and then helps us and brings it to pass. When that desire is grown, it actually shows God is already working. And that's the exciting bit. And will give us whatever we ask according to his will. And we're asking something according to his will because we're picking up what he's saying. So I thought it might be helpful uh, to hear from some of the others about how God is stirring them, how they're kind of seeing what to add into what they've already got. And so we're going to hear from Richard, then Sally, then Grant, and then Jane. Thank you. So for me, the first point was that um, I realised that some of my friendships were quite functional in the sense that we would meet up and we'd have a good time together, but actually we'd go out and do something or we'd come over to do something. And the, the reality was that actually people weren't really getting involved in the messiness that, that is life. So it was because we were always doing something, we weren't necessarily entering into the life that we have and involving ourselves in the family and the messiness of life. Richard, Sally? Yeah, for me, I just felt that um, some of my relationships, when I got together with people, we just talked about superficial things and I just got quite dissatisfied with that and have since really made it um, a point to just try and get beneath the surface and not just be satisfied with um, superficial, superficial conversation. Yeah, and for me, it's simply that I uh, went to play pitch and putt with a couple of friends and uh, later on the thought suddenly occurred to me, why didn't I invite someone else to join us? Um, it's just that inclusivity that I think we'd probably have, have reached out to someone else that we could have easily got someone else to join in with us. Jane? Yeah, for me, I was just reflecting that when I was asked about who my friends were, I more automatically thought of peers, and that's just where my mind went. And I think it's just from, um, I guess, being at school and being categorised by age and year that you normally think of your friends as similar age to you or your peers. But it just struck me that that was a um, worldly view of friendship or natural view and not a biblical view. So it just stirred me to think um, about friendship in a different way and think who might God be nudging me to pursue and think outside the box a lot more. Thank you, Jane. Isn't that interesting? It's not really rocket science, but just a little nudge uh, here and there for Richard to, to move away from what was probably we'd describe as functional. And then for Sally to look for something more than what she realized was a bit sort of social really and then Grant seen an opportunity to include others and then Jane saying oh wait a minute I don't just have to be relating across my normal people group my peers so last week we mentioned uh, a couple of the features of biblical friendship highlighted through the story of David and Jonathan now I, I've made a list of 10 features which I don't have time to go through uh, all of them now uh, features of the relationship between David and Jonathan which we've chosen to take as describing something of biblical fellowship friendship but if you if you'd like to see them uh, all you have to go uh, do is go to the uh, e-briefing and in the question section at the end you'll see them listed out and just click on that and I'll just highlight a couple of them now, uh, just while we're together looking at this. Bible talks about life joints in the body. That's, if you think about a life joint in the body, I suppose you could say my wrist is a life joint from my hand to my arm. Life flows through it. 
Now, I, I'm not medical and I can't really describe all the detail. I just know that if there's a problem with the wrist, it certainly affects the hand. There's a joining which is really close and even the slightest misalignment would cause a problem. In the story of David and Jonathan in 1 Samuel 18, it says this, Jonathan became one in spirit with David. Now that is what God is speaking to us about. That ability to be one in spirit. It's not just natural, it's not just social, it's not just functional. It goes beyond that by the power of the Holy Spirit. In verse 3, it goes on to say, And Jonathan made a covenant with David. That's kind of a commitment, even when it's not really very convenient. I mentioned before our brother Hilton, one of the senior members of the network, how he was willing to turn aside from all sorts of uh, lucrative things and fame just to, just to actually be. In fact, I think it was the last time he came to us, uh, he was going to be um, a big conference and lots of, of recognition, but he chose instead uh, to express his commitment. The second thing, and probably really, really important, is the desire to serve as an expression of friendship. Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do for you. This is about serving a person, not doing a job. This is about expressing love to somebody through an action. And I think really it's one of the primary ways in which God has shown us how to, how to communicate love. Of course, he demonstrated it, he exampled it when he took the towel and the water and he washed the disciples' feet. He broke through so many barriers there. And then, of course, he says, you know, you've seen what I've done, now you do likewise. And he tells us in his word to through love serve one another. Serving thing is a great opportunity to show love. Express it by serving. You know, uh, Fernando, uh, my friend, feels a desire to serve me. And he's had an amazing task with the things that have gone wrong in his house and the building work that didn't work. I've had to persuade him not to come and help me, but I've had to persuade him to stay and do what he needed to do in his own place. You see, there's something about serving, something about expressing love through serving, which is key and important. Now, at a given time, would you expect all these features to be expressed in a given relationship? Yes, yes, at a given time, not all together at one point in time. Do your friendships include all of these? Well, as I've said, at a certain time, I'm not saying all in one day or one session, you might look at a list of things and say, well, in my relationship with so-and-so, I've helped them to find their strength in God and my friendship with, with this person I've given to him and I've loved this person as myself. But what we're really looking for is to express all those things, not all together, not all at the same time, but to express every aspect of that within one friendship and then to do it again within another friendship. This is what God lays out in his word. See, it's easy to mix and match, but once you, you look for all these things in the same relationship, then that suddenly becomes a real challenge. Previously, I shared 
uh, this statement of friendship. This is also available in the question section on the e-briefing if you want to look at it. I desire always to place your interests equal with my own, to serve you, to minister to your needs in any way I can, never to say or agree to things behind your back than not being said to your face, even by keeping silent when they're said. Give the necessary time to hear your thoughts and concerns. Be honest with you regarding any misgivings I might have about your direction. That means loving enough to risk the relationship in confrontation and disagreement. Never take advantage when I see your weakness. Hold on and seek to see issues through when we don't agree. Consider your success, my success, your failure, my failure. Within biblical friendship, these are the kind of expressions that I think it would be right to hear. I'm not frightened by what they might think. You can be open. This is what God has been showing me recently. I've been struggling with my reactions recently. There's vulnerability, there's hearing God, there's a willingness to lay down life. I was very blessed and impressed. Uh, Rachel, as one of those who responded to the questions, gave some definition of biblical friendship. And I'm going to just switch over now, please, to Rachel and ask her to just share that with us. Thank you. Okay. I think big, biblical friendship would be more all-encompassing. I would be interested in all areas of someone's life and their family. I would take time to really listen so that I understand what they are saying and thinking and feeling. I wouldn't just think about them when I saw them, but the things that concern them would concern me. I would seek to speak truthfully to them, even when what I say is not very well received. I would include them in my life and we would do things together. They might not be like me and their life situation might be different to mine, but I would have a genuine heart for them, something that God has put inside me. Because of this, I would enjoy the relationship and seeing them wouldn't be a duty or a job. I would have a sense of what God has for them and see the strengths and potential in them. And I would seek to encourage them to take hold of these things. When they step out, I would be cheering them on. And I would rejoice when things go well. And when things don't work out as planned, I would encourage them to try again. Rachel, that really is a great summary there. This is what God is leading us to. This is what God has set before us. It's an upgrade. It's adding to what we've got. It's moving on to the next stage that we might more accurately show what he's like as we love one another. Because the greatest characteristic quality of God is love. But the truth is, can't do it. Truth is, it's beyond possibility. I can't live up to that definition of friendship. The bar's too high. I don't know about you, but certainly I would say that. Have you ever felt anxious that those you consider a friend might not share the same feeling towards you? Have you ever found yourself lamenting that others haven't been a friend to you instead of thinking how you could be a better friend to them? Have you ever dodged a difficult conversation because how your friend might receive you? Have you ever held back from a friend because you've been burned in the past? I'm sure I fall short of that standard. I can't do it. But God knew I couldn't. So he sends his spirit, who is the greatest friend, to enable me because he supplies all the love that I need. 
I don't need a friend to reciprocate the love I show them. Because he sets my identity, I'm not crushed when my friend says something thoughtless about me. Because he fills me with compassion, I'm willing to cancel my plans to see to their needs. Because he softens my heart, I can weep or rejoice with my friend. Because he nudges me, I can think to say or to do things for my friend at key times. See, brothers and sisters, God has designed us for friendship. I actually need my friend's stories and perspective to help me to see more about God. He set us in a body. We need the members of the body, but we need to be joined in the way that he prescribes. I need them to remind me who God has made me to be. I need my friend not to let me get away with settling for less. I need, my friend needs me to be the arms of his body to give them a hug. As we're transformed through our relationship with God, we expect to be more accurate in our expression of these values. Should I expect all friendships to be mutual? Some, some relationships might be more one way initially. Should I expect a friend to be a friend at this level with everyone in my life? It can be expressed to anyone. Biblical friendship is enabled by the Spirit and he directs us. But it's unlikely that every aspect of biblical friendship will be expressed to every person, but particularly to life joints. Remember, Jesus demonstrates a particular level of friendship with 12 people. I'm not sure that I'd feel ready to be equipped to go beyond that, but aspects to those who he leads and directs in times and places. We have to understand, it's a biblical principle, that we have spheres and within a sphere we have a measure and people have different spheres and people have different measure. The thing that I'm seeing, and this comes out in what we've seen thus far, that so often something can start off as a natural, it's a social friendship, it's a functional friendship. What we're saying, what we believe God is saying is to that must be added this biblical friendship, this spiritual, this supernatural, this thing that represents what God is. But let's swing it the other way around. Sometimes maybe somebody new to us, new amongst us, maybe a new Christian, they have to be embraced, but they need firstly to be embraced not because we know them, not because we have a social connection, not because we even have a functional connection. So we start off there with that spiritual connection, that love of God, that love of God in us. And that then opens the way to develop the natural. So to the, to the natural we add the spiritual and to the spiritual we add the natural. You know, I'm not talking about... Uh, some kind of false religious thing. You know, we're just playing some game and now let us pray. And let us take a moment of silence to consider God. Like the vicar coming to tea. I mean, we're, we're, we're God's people. We're like him. We love, we have fun, we enjoy. But into that, even as we take a meal together and then decide that this would be a great time to share the bread and wine together. Obviously a bit limited at the moment with the current restrictions, but we can find ways. Naturally spiritual and spiritually natural. I want us to, I want us to finish with singing a prayer. Mark's going to come and lead us. Abba Father. Let's just speak to him in that way of love. 
Never let my heart grow cold. We want the very opposite at this time. We want our hearts to be warm, to be quickened, to be stirred, so that we can actually be those who carry and express the love of God, both to him and to one another. God is calling us to a new level of biblical friendship, a new level of expressing what God is like. He set us in the earth for this purpose. He's taking us beyond where we've ever been before. And what an amazing time when there's so many natural restrictions, but God was never caught out. He knows, and he's going to give to us first in our hearts and then opportunities to express. So let's, let's use this prayer. Lord, never let my heart grow cold. And how do we measure our love to God? According to the scripture, it's measured in our love for one another. Let's never kid ourselves. That's the biblical measure of our love for God. Abba Father, let me be yours and yours alone. So Lord, as we conclude this time, that's our prayer. Lord, let our hearts never grow cold, never be demonstrated in a lack of love for one another. Lord, in this time, we look to you to make us what you've called us to be, to love you and to love one another and thereby demonstrate your life and be lights in the darkness. Let the power 
of your Holy Spirit. Let the melting of our hearts, let the direction of our thinking, our thoughts, come directly from you so that we might now move into being doers, not just hearers of the word. By your grace and by your spirit we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to this podcast by Lifeline Church. We hope this message has been an encouragement to you. We are a relational church with a passion to demonstrate God's love to one another and our surrounding community in real and practical ways. We believe that God has called us to have an impact on our families, our communities and our nation. We'd love to connect further with you, so please do visit our website at lifelinechurch.co.uk, on Facebook, lifeline.church.uk or Twitter at Lifeline UK. Thank you.